real experience with Christ, with the Lord in Jesus' name. Grant us the very mind of Christ and grant us the life of a real Christian leader. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless everyone. I say God bless everyone. And the Lord turn our lives around for the better in Jesus' name. I want to remind you that we are here for leaders' development. I know we've been calling it a leaders' meeting. But you know sometimes when just say meeting, meeting, meeting. What's the purpose of the meeting? And what are you expecting to get? And what do you want to see from the word of God? That's why the other Saturday I said, we're now for Saturday, workers tell me, training. Now I come today, I said it is a Tuesday, leaders development. Really, really. Because, um, you know, as you come, you want to understand that the Lord is expecting leaders that are growing. And leaders that grow in the understanding of the scriptures. And leaders that grow in the understanding of the Christian experience we ought to have. As we look at the chapter we have looked at today for our search the scripture session. And this is a kind of chapter that uh, some preachers will avoid some real deep things in the word of God. But as we come for development, we need to understand, you look at David, you say, this man had an experience with the Lord. We talk about genuine salvation. And we talk about real sanctification. And we talk about the heart of a man that is following after God. And you can see a lot in this chapter. As we look at the prayer of David in Psalm 51, you begin to understand what he thought, what he knew, what he experienced about real salvation. We're looking at Psalm 51. You'll see on top of that psalm, a psalm of David. Here he is prayed and said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. He knew what salvation actually meant and he knew how to have that salvation. He said, my transgression standing between me and God, my iniquity standing between me and God, blot everything out, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. He understood that when you are praying for salvation, you must be cleansed, you must be washed from all transgression. And then he said, for I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. As we go out and witness to other people, evangelize other people, we're doing soul winning, we need to understand the kind of prayer they must pray. And we need to understand they must realize that they this is sin and this is evil and it is what we ourselves have experienced and then we are able to pass it on to others. It says against thee and thee only have I sinned. You see, he knew about his sin. It wasn't uh, you know, laying blame on other people. This one did this, this one did that. They made me say this. They made me say that. He said against you have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. He didn't minimize sin. You see, as we are preaching and we're leaders and we're talking to people they need to come to the Lord we're not minimizing their sin we're not minimizing their evil we're not telling them yes this one is an error is it a sin or an error this one is a mistake is it a sin or is it a mistake this one is a shortcoming is it a sin or is it a shortcoming this one is a weakness the weakness of the human being is it a weakness or sin he said I sinned against thee. And he said, I've done this evil that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. He said, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. Thou desirest truth in the inward parts. As we look at salvation today, the people who claim to be saved and they claim to be born again is just the outward thing. No, I've changed my dressing. I've changed my look. I don't have paintings. I don't have palming. I don't have this and that. 
But you know, salvation is beyond the external thing. Oh yes, there's a change outwardly. And then there's a change inwardly. Because it says, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with Aesop. And I shall be clean, wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear the joy and the gladness of the bones which thou art broken, may rejoice. When he said, he came under conviction. He came under sorrow. He came under internal turmoil. He came under suffering within. You see, there are people today, even they call themselves Christians. If they sin, there's no internal sorrow. There's no internal suffering. They just carry on life. But in the case of David, that man had genuine experience of salvation. When he fell, when he did something he shouldn't have done, it was like a dagger in the heart. Sorrow in the heart. He said, it's like my bones were broken and now I'm praying for restoration I'm praying for salvation so that I may rejoice Say, hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities create in me a clean heart a clean heart there is an outward aspect of salvation there's an inward aspect of salvation you can tell you can tell look at David today as this the Malachite brought the death of Saul information about the death of Saul you can tell on the inside he wasn't rejoicing. That man had a change outwardly. He had a change inwardly. And that's what he prayed for. When you are saved, there is an outward change. When you are born again, there's an inward change. I'm not just talking to you. I'm talking to the people you are talking to. I'm talking to the people that are coming to the kingdom through you. That you make them understand there is a clean heart. Creating me a clean heart to God. Renew a right spirit within me. You can tell as they brought that information. Look at the attitude. Look at his sorrow. He tore his clothes. This is a man that was chasing him all around. This is a man that was persecuting him. This is a man that did not want him to leave but all the same when he heard about the death of the man, how sorrowful he was as if the person that died was his closest friend as if he was his benefactor and then you can see the dirt. You can see what he said about sorrow all high high things real appreciation you know as whole denominations today and whole churches today and they gather together kill my enemy destroy my enemy get rid of my enemy when their enemies die they don't have this and you can't you ask the question are they saved only god can tell are they born again? Only God can tell. The people that rejoice at the death of sinners, at the death of their persecutors, are the people that went to hell and they are rejoicing because of, of that. Only God can tell about the spiritual state. But in the case of a David, you can see the sorrow in his heart and you can see all that he said. He said, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy Thy salvation uphold me with thy free spirit. Look at verse 13. Then, after I'm sure I'm saved, then, after I'm sure of that transformation and restoration, then, after that inward change has taken place and the external change has taken place, it says, Then will I teach transgressors thy way and sinners shall be converted unto thee. As we look at uh, this uh, man today, you understand what salvation is all about. He knew, he knew. Look at chapter 24 of the Psalms. In Psalms 24, I'm reading from verses 3 and 4. It says, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands outwardly, outwardly, your outward actions, your outward life, your outward behavior. It says, there's a change here the dirt is gone the defilement is gone the blood is gone cleansed away from his side and the guilt is gone it says if you tell me you are saved if you tell me you are a pilgrim to heaven it says you must have number one is a clean hands and then number two a pure heart there's an inward part of the salvation there is an inward manifestation that 
here is a child of God on the inside. You can see the purity of heart. And when he brought that information, you can see the condition of his heart. It's not just a man that is outwardly religious. It's a man that was inwardly righteous. It says, he that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. The whole word of God is given to us to prepare us for life. Prepares for life. It is when situations like these happen in life. Your greatest enemy is dead and you've got the information. The greatest opposer is dead and you have the information. And the most terrible, terrifying, terrorizing oppressor, persecutor is gone, is dead, and you have the information. It's then we understand your experience, whether you are born again or not, whether you are a child of God or not. It is then we understand what has grace effected in your life, what has grace done in your heart. And we can see from the attitude of this man, and the reason we need to study this is because the word of God is given to us for ministry. As you look at the ministry and you look at your people, you look at their prayer requests and you look at their attitude when their enemies die and you look at their attitude when their boss in the place of work, when something happens to them, you can tell, are these people saved? Are we just laboring or religious people or people that do not have experience with the Lord or those who are really saved? The word of God is given to us to prepare us for heaven. And if we're being prepared for heaven, our lives will change. It is to give us eternal rewards. And each passage of scripture is to contribute to our training and contribute to our development. Teachers and leaders must faithfully go to the word of God and say, look at the word of God. Is there something here the Lord is teaching us? Is there something here the Lord is revealing to us? You see, we must rightly divide the word of God. We're looking at second, we're looking at second Timothy chapter two, and I'm reading from verse fifteen. Second Timothy chapter two. And we're looking at this from verse 15. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not uh, to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Now I've read all this and I've said all this for you to understand. There are some passages of scriptures that normally should make us sad. There are some passages of scripture normally that should give us comfort and encouragement. There are some passages of scriptures that will bring conviction to us. Now, if we're going to rightly divide the word of God, we must not be silent where the word cries out. The word cries out against the sin of leadership. And we must not be silent, must not become uh, so afraid of talking to the leaders, knowing that that word of God is given for a particular purpose. We we'll say, look at this word, look at the example here, look at the examples of the lives of the people. If we shy away from the real sin, then we are not rightly dividing the word of truth. We cannot entertain our hearers when the word threatens them. There are threat, uh, threatenings in the word of God. And when you read those threatenings of the word of God, you cannot modify, you cannot motivate, you cannot say, okay, I'm going to interpret it this way. What's the purpose? Why that word was given? And as we look at this chapter, what's the purpose this chapter was written in the Bible? And what are we supposed to learn here? And there are words of warning. We cannot overlook them. And there are words of caution. There are words of judgment. We cannot overlook them. Must not be the preacher or the preachers that are always in peace, peace when there is no peace. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6, and I'm reading here from verse 14. Jeremiah chapter 6, we're looking at verse 14. It says, They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. There are pictures wherever they go in the Bible. 
whatever they are reading in the Bible, uh, they just uh, bring a word of comfort every time, a word of encouragement every time, and they entertain their people every time. You are wondering, is that the meaning of that word? Is that the teaching in that word? Is that what the Lord has for us in that word? You come to this second Samuel chapter 1. And you see the details there. And then the preacher comes here now. And out of that passage is only for, you know, to entertain us, encourage us, and lift us up, and make us clap our hands. And we're wondering, is that why every chapter of the Bible is written? You must find out, what's the intention of this chapter? What do we learn from this chapter? What are we getting from this chapter? Otherwise, we'll be telling them peace, peace, when there's no peace. Jeremiah chapter 8, and I'm reading from verse 7. Jeremiah chapter 8, and here we're reading from verse 7. It tells us in verse 7, it says, Ye, the stalk in the heaven noise are appointed times, and the turtle and the crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming, but my people know not the judgment of the Lord. My people know not the judgment of the Lord. You know, the people who are superficial, the people who read the word of God and already they made up their minds the message they are going to get and they impose that on the word of God. They say everything I read in the Bible is for encouragement. Everything I read in the Bible is for entertainment. Everything I read in the Bible is to give me joy. And because they reach that into the Bible and they impose what they want on the Bible, they never get the real meaning. And that's why it says the turtle and the stalk, they know their time but my people know not the judgment of the Lord. How do you say we are wise in verse 8? And the law of the Lord is with us. Lo, certainly in vain, the image in the pen of the scribe is in vain. The wise men are ashamed and they are dismayed and taken. Lo, they have rejected the word of the Lord. What wisdom is in them. It says, because they rejected the word of the Lord, what wisdom do they have in verse 11? But they have healed the heart of the daughter of my people slightly. Tell me what follows. Saying, peace, peace. When there's no peace, if you're invited, you know, to places where there's false doctrine, places where there's false experience, places where there's false hope of eternal life and then you have to bring the word of God to them and then they tell you thank you for coming we appreciate your coming uh, people here they need encouragement the sinners here need encouragement and the backsliders here need encouragement what are you going to do you go to the word of God you're not going to tell them peace peace when you know that judgment is hanging on them in fact it tells us in Jeremiah chapter 48 Jeremiah chapter 48, I'm reading from verse 10. Jeremiah chapter 48, we're looking at verse 10. Have you opened your Bible? It is very important. I don't know whether you ever saw this uh, word in the Bible before, but look at this. Cause it be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully. The people who come to preach and they preach deceitfully. The people who minister and they minister deceitfully. The people who are trying to help the children of God, but they never made any impact. Whatever will pinch them, whatever will convict them, whatever will kind of uh, correct them, they shy away from that. It says, cause it be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully and cause it be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. What's that? The sword of the spirit, the word of God to pierce them, to convict them. To convince them of sin and to make them run out of that sin and run to the arms of the Savior of the Lord. But the person that will keep back the sword of the Spirit so that he doesn't want people to be uncomfortable. He doesn't want people to be sorrowful. He doesn't want people to be prigged in their conscience. He doesn't want people to be hurt in any way. And he's always very careful. Make them happy. Make them comfortable. That's not a minister. That's not a leader. That's not a preacher of the new covenant. It says, Cause it be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully. Are you like that? When somebody is sinning, 
when somebody is doing evil where you can tell that the evidence of salvation is not even there externally and it's not there internally and you know that and the only thing you are saying every time peace peace everything will be all right no everything is not all right we need to come with the word of god and let the people know that this is right or that is wrong i'm looking at ezekiel chapter 14 ezekiel chapter 14 and we're looking at what the word of god is saying to the people that are making the unbelievers happy the sinners happy and all the all the people that talk to repent is make, making them to stay and to abide in their sins i'm looking at uh, chapter 14 of ezekiel reading from verse 17 verse 17 it says uh, in Ezekiel chapter 14 verse 17 oh, If I bring a sword upon the land And say sword go through the land So that I cut off the man and the beast Ezekiel that's uh, chapter 14 uh, I, should, I should be in chapter 13 Let's look at chapter 13 Let's look at what it says Ezekiel chapter 13 And I'm reading from verse uh, 17 Are you there now? It says, Likewise, thou son of man, set thy face against the daughters of thy people. Ah, daughters of thy people. You know, there are people that look at the feminine side, they look at the women, they look at, you know, those weaker vessels, and they can never preach any word that will bring conviction. They say, You know, I'm so tender and I'm so gentle and I'm so loving that uh, you know whatever the women are doing uh, you know we just have to understand their nature and even if they are doing things that will land them in hellfire all the same all the same we cannot hurt anybody here is the Lord saying Ezekiel go tell them go tell them the daughters it says uh, the daughters of thy people and pro which prophesy out of their own hearts and prophesy thou against them. It says there are daughters that are also prophesying and they're trying to proclaim, they're trying to preach, they're trying to tell other people the way of God, but they're saying it out of their own heart. They're not preaching the real word of God. And it goes on to say, and say, thus says the Lord God, woe to the women that sow pillows to all ham holes and make Cashes uh, upon the head of every statue, and then he goes on to haunt the souls. Will ye haunt the souls of my people, and will ye save the souls alive that come unto you? It says they make things convenient for them, comfortable for them, and the women, as they have chance to talk to other people, all they're doing is just make cushion for them and make them sleep off in their sin. Look at verse 22 because with lies ye have made the heart of the righteous sad whom I have not made sad and with lies you have strengthened the hands of the wicked that he should not return from his wickedness from his wicked way by promising him that therefore ye shall no more uh, ye shall see no more vanity nor divine nor divine divinations for I will deliver my people out of your hand and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Give me a good amen. amen. The Lord is serious about leaders deceiving other people in their sins. Making them comfortable in their sin. Making them rejoice or rest or relax in their sins. He wants us to preach the word of God and preach it faithfully and preach it fervently and preach it forcefully. Isaiah chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 20. Isaiah chapter 5 and we're looking at verse 20. In Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. One to them that will call false doctrine good and will call sound doctrine evil just because it makes them uncomfortable. 
because it makes them on, not to have rest, because it makes them jerk a little bit and say, uh -huh, looks like uh, the arrow of the world is coming my way. And because they don't want that, then they call sound doctrine evil and they call false doctrine good. And the word of God says, one to them that call evil good and good evil that put darkness for light and light for darkness that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter look at verse 23 which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous of the righteous from him i needed to see all that because of what we're looking at today in second samuel chapter one second samuel chapter one i'm going to read now from verse six tonight we're looking at this the endless agony of deceitful praise seekers the endless agony of deceitful praise seekers you see when you come to the word of god and you want to preach you must ask yourself are you seeking for the praise of your congregation? Are you seeking for the praise of the people around you? Are you seeking for a well done? Are you waiting for a handshake from the people that listen to you? Are you waiting for the comments? That was good. That was encouraging. That was exciting. That was uplifting. That was very good. I never thought of that before. I appreciate the way you are presented it today. That was good. And the fellow is a sinner. The fellow is a backslider. The fellow is a criminal. The fellow is a wicked man. Is a wicked woman. And yet you say, I love what you have said today. If you had told her, if you had told him what John the Baptist Baptist told Herod, he'll not an honor, see that was very good. If you were straight, if you went straight and you looked directly at him and you say, Hey, Herod, it's not right for you to take your brother's wife. Then you understand whether they appreciate the preaching or not. You're not preaching for praise of men. You're not preaching for the appreciation of men. You're not preaching for somebody to say that was nice. That's why we need to look at this word and see the endless agony of deceitful praise seekers. I'm looking at Second Samuel chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 6, and the young man that told him said, as I happened to chance, by chance upon Mount Gilboa, behold, Saul leaned upon his spear, and lo, the chariots and the horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me, and called unto me, and I answered, here am I. And he said unto me, Who art thou? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite. And he said unto me, Again, stand, I pray thee upon me, and slay me, for anguish is come upon me, because my life is yet whole in me. And I stood upon him and slew him because i was sure that he could not lay after that he was falling and i took the crown that was upon his head and the bracelets that on his arm and i brought them hither unto my lord you can tell this paving the way and the man was looking for recognition he was looking for praise. He was looking for appreciation. He, because he knew, he knew that uh, Saul was an avowed enemy of David. And now that, you know, he happened to ch by chance to get there. And then he had the evidence. I was there. And I took the crown. And I took the bracelets. And I brought to you. Because he didn't just say I brought it to you. He said I brought it to my Lord. He was looking for something. And then look at what follows. And David took cold on his clothes the young man wasn't expecting this and wrenched them and likewise all the men that were with him and they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan his son and for the people of the Lord for the house of Israel because they were falling 
by the sword. And David said to the young man that told him, Where art thou? And he answered, I am the son of a stranger. Ah, no doubt. I'm the son of a stranger and an Amalekite. And David said unto him, How was thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Is the Lord's anointed so cheap before you? Is the Lord's anointed so insignificant that you could stretch out your hand and then you destroyed? You're telling me you killed the Lord's anointed. Have you heard my story? Have you heard when I saw this anointed of the Lord and somebody told me he's delivered into your hand? Kill him. Have you, say, have you learned what I said? That never, I will never stretch out my hand to kill the Lord's anointed. What's the relationship with Saul the king? I have a relationship with him. I killed the Philistine. I pledged the harp. And then the evil spirit departed from him. He should have appreciated that he did not. He threw a javelin wanting to kill me. I escaped two times. And yet, you're telling me you killed him? When it was my chance, my opportunity to kill him, I said never. Because I understand the significance of the anointing of the Lord upon the man. And you stranger, a Malikite came over here to tell me what your mouth that you killed the anointed of the Lord and David said in verse 16 unto him thy blood be upon thy head for thy mouth has testified against thee saying I have slain the Lord's anointed we're looking at chapter 4 chapter 4 we're looking at verse 10 chapter 4 verse 10 when one told me saying behold Saul is dead. Thinking to have brought good tidings, I took hold of him and slew him in Siklag, who thought that I would have given him a reward for his tidings. Actually, the man came looking for reward, promotion, appreciation, the endless agony of deceitful Praise seekers. He was seeking for praise. He got punishment. There are three things we're going to look at. Number one, the sudden death of an Amalekite deceiver. The sudden death of an Amalekite deceiver. Point number two is the spiritual deadness of ambitious deceivers. The spiritual deadness of ambitious deceivers. Number three, the second death of apostate believers, deceivers. The second death of apostate deceivers. We're coming to number one. Tell me number one there. The sudden death of an Amalekite deceiver. We're looking at uh, Second Samuel again, chapter 1. And we're reading from verse 14. And David said unto him, How wast thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? If I were not um, a leader in our church, and I was to preach on this, I really talk. Because you see, the world in which we live, and the church of the latter day, the church of the end time, has no respect for the anointing on leadership. And what the world does to their leaders, they criticize, they destroy, they impeach, they vote against, they have conspiracy, they do quite a lot to unseat the leadership of the world. They write, they dramatize, they demonstrate, they do a lot all to destroy their leaders in the world. And they say, 
will bring him down, will destroy him, will erase his effect in the nation. The same thing many churches do. Once you speak a word that goes against an herald in that church, once you speak against a Jezebel in that church, and once you speak against a Zacchaeus that is cheating people in business, and then is uh, duping people in the church, and wants to stand very clearly against adultery and fornication, and you speak without fear, without favor, on the revealed word of God. There are people, they don't care about the anointing on the leadership, and then they will destroy, they will defame, they will do anything, and yet David was asking the man, as the Lord is asking everyone here today, how is it you are not afraid, not only to touch, not only to defile, not only to make fall, to make him fall into sin, but to make him fall, to take off his life. How is it you are not afraid? To destroy the Lord's anointed. And David called one of the young men and said, Go near, fall upon him, and he smote him that he died. The sudden death of an Amalekite deceiver. You see, he came to deceive, and he came to seek praise. And he came to say, I destroyed the man that God anointed and placed upon the nation. And the people that have that kind of understanding, and they say, hey, pastor, hey, leader, be careful. We are here, and we don't have the fear of God. We don't have respect for anointing. We don't have respect for the calling of God upon anybody. They've been in other churches before. And now they come to a church like this and they say, We can destroy the Lord's anointed. I'm not talking, I'm not talking about myself only. We have our state overseers, we have our region overseers, we have our pastors over here at the headquarters. It may be on that local church, it may be on that group of church, and there's somebody that is saying, Hey, watch it. I hear what you say, I learn how you preach. Now we have the weapon in our hands. We don't, we don't have to use, uh, you know, gun now or whatever. We can say things. We can say directly, gone are the days. We only say it one to one. Now we have the social media. Now we have the internet. Now we have this. It doesn't take us too much. We know what to do. We can destroy the man within one week. Maybe you can, but God is greater. And God will not allow you to put the whole church of God in a scattered form, in a scattered way. That it will put in your puny hand, in your insignificant hand, the ability to destroy the Lord's anointed. Hey, before you do that, sudden death will come upon you. Because, you know, upon this rock I built my church, and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Respect the anointing. You understand? When it's not the man, you look at a leader in a country. You look at a leader in a company. You look at a leader in a community. You might, you might be more educated than him. You might be wiser than him. You might uh, know some good and ratio more than him. But he carries the anointing. He carries the calling. He carries the commission. And you want to respect that. You look at this man, a Malachite stranger. And he said, I destroyed the king of Israel. Israel was the greatest nation on earth. Israel was a nation that 
came out of Abraham, Isaac, and uh, Jacob. Israel was the one that God told, I'm going to have war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. This was the man they anointed the Lord saw that God said, go, destroy all the Amalekites. Ah, no wonder if Saul had done what the Lord said when he gave him the power, the anointing, the authority, and, and the sword to destroy all of them. Where will you, stranger, come and come to tell David now, I destroyed the anointed of the Lord. I pray you'll not be a stranger. You'll not be an Amalekite. They die suddenly. Those who want to kill leadership, they die suddenly. Those who want to scatter the church of God, they die suddenly. Those who minimize the anointing that Jesus paid for on the cross of Calvary. And he says, I'm building my church. And he sets an anointed man, anointed woman. He sets them there to do the work. And then you are conspiring together behind. And you say, I'll destroy the man. I'll destroy the woman. I'll destroy the church. You'll die before that can happen. Because you see, the church is precious. Think about it. If the evangelists in our nation, if they are destroyed. Think about it. If the pastors and the preachers in our nation, if they are destroyed. Think about it. The people that God has raised up and he says, they are for the salvation of the millions and the multitudes in our land. Think about it. If, some, if a day will be given to somebody's hand and then you destroy them and becomes a leaderless church, a headless church, a church that has a no leader anymore because suddenly suddenly Somebody there touched the anointing of the Lord and then it's gone. And then, you know, the Lord will just be looking at you like that. Says, well done, well done. Well, what is the next person you are going to destroy? The Lord will not allow that to happen. The Amalekite will die before this will happen. The stranger will die before this will happen. And this is prophetic. Don't think I'm just preaching. This is prophetic. And if anybody wants to try, he can try. But we still have God on the throne. This church will stand. The leadership in the church will stand. And any deceiver, Amalekite deceiver, wanting to have this gain, wanting to have that other gain, and he wants to destroy leadership, uh -uh, it will not happen. Uh, uh, you, know, you know what they do? Sometimes they don't tell us, but we know. But sometimes they also tell us, they tell us, those politicians, they tell us, they tell us that, you know, that party was in power. And as that party was in power, there, were, there was another party, you know it in our land, it's even in the papers today, and then, you know one of the leaders of uh, this, uh, of the ruling party now said, I'm going to now reveal it to you. I've not spoken for a long time. I'm now going to tell you how we plotted the downfall of the other party. That's what, it, it's not coming out. It's not saying this is what we did. This is how they did it. And there are people like that. You have that other church. That other denomination. And you see that there is still a church standing. Standing on the word of God. And thank God we are standing. Yeah. Somebody there said I thank God we are standing. Yeah. And then, then on the other side they say how is this church like that? Why are they standing like that? And then, the way they do it in politics, they will send people inside. Join them. Be with them. And as you are with them, then see what they are doing. And then see how to influence some people there. So that you can disturb, you can distract, you can defile, you can do whatever and then they begin to do that and then they're giving a report back to the other side this is what we did uh-huh that's good go on go on go on until that if we are down that church must also come down this church will not come down yeah. there was uh, somebody before thank god for the spirit of god before i tell you i say thank god for the spirit of god you know it was to bagada and there was this man, 
and he was coming in and going out and he found the place among the trusted people trusted leaders and those trusted two of them two of those leaders and those leaders had access to me any time and every time and uh, so he, but I, I never I never trusted him but he was you know all the time saying pastor we thank God for this church and we love this church and this is wonderful and this is beautiful and then he'll be giving suggestion you know if we do this we'll make more progress if we do this we'll reach more people if I, I have this contact I have this contact I never thought that those things were real but these two other leaders in the church very close to me they will be telling me they said this man has ideas this man has connections and you know but I never I never accepted that thank God for the Spirit of God but the little information you could get from those two people, sometimes he'll push them, go ask him. He'll push them, go tell him this, go tell him that. And uh, eventually, one day, Monday Bible study, at about four o'clock, I was sent for to come to the headquarters of the SSS, State Security Service. And I said, what? I have Bible study today. But he said, you must come. And so I went with, uh, you know, some of our leaders, and uh, we got there, we sat down in the office, and they brought a big a book, uh, that's uh, like ledger, some things that had been written here, there, that man had been giving them information, because he had no work, that's where he was getting salary, and he was getting salary so that he can be a secret agent, and if he didn't tell lies, he will not get money. And so he'll tell them this lie, this lie, and they opened everything. And then one of the people I went with was an officer herself, be, you know, an exalted officer in that SSS. And he said, hey, this is my pastor. All these things that are written here, not one of them is true. And then those people looked at me and, you know, when you see an innocent man, you can tell. Those people have been trained to know how to detect criminals. And uh, so when they looked at me like this, they shook their heads and then they called that other officer aside. They said, this other man that is giving us information, is he a member of your church? And that uh, sister said, no, not a member of our church. He's just coming. It's just to get money from you. And eventually they told us, I did. the very next week, I didn't even see that man. To say, why did you do this? He vanished into thin air. He ran away. And since that time, I'm talking about many years ago now, we have not seen him. And then the two people, the two leaders who have been coming to me and have been introducing the man, they felt, uh, you know, so sorry that Pastor, we got into this uh, kind of trouble. And then I left that place, I think around to six, we ran to Bagara for Bible study. And, uh, you know, I was breathing up and down because, you know, we were, at, we were in a hurry and we really ran. But before the Bible study, I just said myself, I said, praise the Lord, we have Bible study today. And the people did not know what was going on behind the scene because a stranger and a Malachite came in to destroy the Lord's anointed. But now he's gone. I said, now he's gone. I've got to tell you a lot of other stories, but you know, it's just to tell you that once in a while we come across these people, but the worse they do, the better we become. Yeah. Happens to them. And read. It says, uh, evening and morning and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud. Then it says, and he shall hear my voice. He will hear your voice in Jesus' name. 
but you, you want to make sure that you are not uh, you are not uh, kind of uh, fraternizing with the people that want to destroy the people of God. Look at verse 23 now it says but thou O God shall bring them down into the pit of destruction. Bloody and deceitful men shall not live half their days but I will trust in thee. You see, there are some people, some people are so hungry for the praise of men, they lose their character because they are seeking the praise of men. They, they lose their watchfulness because they are seeking the praise of men. They lose their soul, they lose their honesty, and they lose their focus on heaven because they are seeking the praise of men. They are so hungry of praise, they forget the possible consequences. They are so hungry of praise that they forget the consequence of what they're doing on themselves, on their family, on their future. These uh, priest seekers, they, will not, they were expecting rewards, but they got death. Look at this Amalekite was expecting, wonderful, give me that crown. And then he thought, David will put it on the head and say, come on now, I'll promote you. He was looking for promotion, but he got perdition. He was looking for praise, he got punishment. He was looking for monetary reward, but he got misery. He was looking for riches, he got the wrath of God. He was looking for dignity, he got damnation. He was looking for benefit and favor, he got brimstone and fire. He was looking for exceeding support, he got eternal suffering. You see the people that are so hungry of the praise of men. I want praise. I want appreciation. And then they want to go and tell somebody, I'm destroying the leadership there. I'm destroying the anointed of the Lord there. What they think they're looking for, they're not going to get. They're going to get the opposite. I pray you will not be in their company in Jesus' name. The spiritual deadness of ambitious deceivers ambitious deceivers you see this deceiver that came he was ambitious ambitious and he knew that now david is going to be the king and he was the first one to come to announce the death of Saul. he was the first one to come and to say look at the crown that he had and the bracelets that he had i took everything i brought everything to you now but you see like the dead such ambitious deceitful priest seekers they are not conscious of proper decorum they don't understand and, and look at the attitude of david when the man told the david and david had the proper decorum but the priest seekers will not understand and uh, you know they, they don't understand they expect a response or reaction when a king has died when a leader has died when the exalted man of God has said you know gone to the great beyond those who are dead they have no feeling those who are dead they have no good thoughts those who are dead they cannot hear they cannot know and they shamefully pursue their sinful ambition until they meet their doom the ambitious priest seekers a dead and death.
world. The spirit is dead. The understanding is dead. The soul is dead. And they turn things upside down. That's why it's saying, before judgment comes, it says, Awake, thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. I pray it will happen. You see, there are people who are dead. In fact, we are told in First Timothy, First Timothy chapter five. I'm reading from verse six. It says, "But she that liveth in pleasure is dead." What she liveth? What does she live in pleasure? She wants the praise of men more than the praise of God. What does she live in pleasure? Because she wants to attract the men rather than attracting the favor of God. And it says she that does that, living in pleasure, having this ulterior motive, all they want is the praise of men and the appreciation of men and the attraction to men. They are dead while they live. It tells us in Jude verse 12. Jude verse 12. It tells us, uh, it says, these are spots in your feast of charity. That means they come to the meeting, they come to the assembly of the children of God. These are spots in your feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, Feeding themselves without fear. They don't care about him. Correction, conviction, discipline. That one doesn't bother them. They still carry on whatever evil they want to carry on. Clouds they are without water. Carried about with way of winds and trees whose fruit withereth. Look at this without fruit. Tell me what follows there. Twice dead. Say it aloud. They were dead before, and then they came to life. They say, I'm born again. I'm a child of God. They're dead again. They're dead again. They're backsliding. They become apostates. It says, they're twice dead, plucked up by the roots. And then it tells us that judgment eventually will come. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. And to the angel of the church in Sunday's right, this six says he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, tell me, and at dead, at dead, as a name that thou livest, this was even a leader, the angel of the church. He said, this, You have a name that you live, you have a record that you live, you have the uh, people think that you are alive, but he says, But you are dead. And uh, those people that have spiritual deadness, and uh, those who like uh, this Amalekite that came, very much ambitious, ambitious. You see, uh, the ambition is not for heaven, the ambition is not for holiness, the ambition is not for sanctification the ambition is not for total transformation the ambition is i'll be by the side of king david now that i brought the crown unto him and nobody has given him something like this except me and it's all flattery it's all praise seeking but thank god david understood i said david understood you know, there are people that, you know, they come and near. And they want to be able to have a conspicuous position. You know, when somebody is down there, when somebody is a large crowd, you have about um, 100,000 people. And you have one solitary person there. And uh, nobody even knows that, you know, the fellow is there. Whatever evil he wants to do, he does not have the platform to do that evil. And then, but he has the, he's looking for position. He's looking for the the praise of men and then he's trying to warm his way through and warm her way through until he comes to a higher position a higher place but the heart is not changed the evil he she wanted to do is still there she wants it's easy for somebody up there to throw an arrow at somebody down there but you know it's not easy for somebody among in a 100,000 a congregation to throw arrow at somebody that is on that other corner but standing in a privileged place because uh, the undiscerning leaders have allowed him have allowed her to warm their way through now they can stay at that high platform and then destroy but God will bring them down yeah. before they come to that position and if they're in that position already for the sake of the church 
for the sake of Calvary, for the sake of the souls of the people that depend only on us to hear the word and to get saved and to get to heaven, for the sake of the millions of people that are looking up to this church, that they have the word, the word of eternal life, and they want to soak in the whole word of God and get saved and get to heaven for the sake of those never dying souls who are saying, give us the word, we want to go to heaven for their sake. Those people that want to hinder the flowing, the free flow of the word of eternal life, the Lord will bring them down. For the sake of Calvary, for the sake of Christ, for the sake of what Christ suffered on the cross of Calvary. Look at that Amalekite coming. Look at that stranger. He wants to win the heart of our King David for the sake of the nation of Israel. Oh Lord, get rid of that Amalekite in Jesus' name. We need to understand that in these last days, there are people, they're looking for jobs, they're looking for money, they're looking for whatever it is, and they, they come there, they don't understand Calvary. They don't understand the cross. They don't understand the gospel. They don't understand heaven. They don't understand without holiness, no man shall see the Lord, and they are just there, Lord, deal with them. They either come under conviction and get converted, but if they are not here for conversion, how do we allow them to hinder the hundreds of thousands and the millions of people that say, this is my last hope. I've been to that church, I didn't get the gospel. I've been to that church, I didn't have the gospel. I've been to that place, I didn't get the gospel. And now I've come here and I see the way the word of God is preached without fear, without favor. Oh Lord, thank God for this church that brought me here. There's no other hope anywhere for them except in this place and then somebody wants to come in he wants to destroy he wants to destroy the leadership he wants to destroy the church he wants to destroy the foundation he wants to destroy the preaching of holiness he wants to destroy everything that will take us to heaven how will God just look at him or look at her and allow this church to go down the drain it will not happen God will show his love for millions of people, even the people that are not yet born again. You know, uh, all these, uh, you have been going around now, I've never seen the things I'm seeing right now. Uh, the open door the Lord is given. And then maybe you don't understand because we didn't transmit. We well, were in a Sabbath, Sunday morning, Sunday morning service, and see thousands and thousands of people inside and outside, and the governor was there, the wife was there, all the executive of the government they were there and waited until the end of the service altar call they were there and then writing the names they were there and then praying for the sick they were there all the time of testimony I even thought that he would go because he had appointment in his party uh, to go but he said this one I will finish this one I never saw that in our life, in our ministry before. And then we went from Asaba in the morning and went to Portacot in the evening. Before I got there, the deputy governor was already seated. And then when, you know, after we got there, the governor came, the wife came, and all the executive, and you know, see all the, 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 the convoy of cars that came out with them. And then he was there. And when he was to speak, you know what he said? He said, we started this last month, September and that he is the one that wears the shoe that knows where the shoe is pinching and that as a governor of that state he has seen tremendous change in the state between September and this time and he told all the people he said this man of God the government of this state we are going to partner with him we're going to bring the people. Then he said, the, the, the brother made the announcement, said, you know, some of the executives, they are here. When he got there, he said, uh, the brother said, some. He said, no, not some. He said, all of them are here. He said, God brought me in. And God made me to choose them to come in. And I tell them, every month this revival is coming on, that our Father in the Lord, God will give him strength. We know he's getting older, but God will give him strength. He will keep coming, and that all of us will be there. And he told all the people, he said, God is doing something through this church. And he mentioned deeper life, your church, our church, 
and he said God is doing something and they said they are going to be part of it now as God is open, opening doors of opportunity then for somebody a rat somewhere cockroach somewhere scorpion somewhere a snake serpent spirit somewhere to crawl in and destroy the anointed of the Lord God forbid the prayers of the people of God will bring that Amalekite down that's why the Lord is said, look at that passage. The man came and he came with confidence. He came running and he said, David, I have information for you. What information do you have? Saul is dead. Tell it not in Gaz. Reveal it not in Ashkelon. Let not the daughters of the Philistines hear that this has happened to the exalted man, to the anointed man of God, Saul. Don't say that again. He said, Saul, how are the mighty fallen and the weapons of war, they are all destroyed. He said, Jonathan, my brother, your love is greater than the love of women. I never saw love like this. I never saw humility like this. You want to tell me Jonathan is dead? You want to tell me Saul is dead? Are you happy? Are you telling me that you are the one that killed the anointed? He said, like, get rid of this man. I don't want to see him in my kingdom. A black sheep like this, a goat like this, will not be at the foundation of my kingdom. That's what the Lord is telling us. And the Lord is bringing us to point number three. The second death of apostate deceivers. The second death of apostate deceivers. We're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 13. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're looking at verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. Deceiving and being deceived. But they will come down. Psalm 9, I'm reading from verse 5. Psalm 9, we're looking at verse 5. Psalm 9, verse 5, it tells us in verse 5, in verse 5, it says, Thou hast rebuked the heathen. Thou hast destroyed the wicked. Thou hast put out their name forever and ever. Verse 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell. The Amalekites shall be turned into hell. The destroyers of the anointed of the Lord shall be turned into hell. And all the nations that forget God. We're looking at Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 10. Revelation chapter 14. And we're looking at verse 10. It says, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image or whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Those are the Amalekites, those are the priest seekers, those are the destroyers of the anointed of the Lord. The Lord will deal with them brimstone and fire. It says in chapter 19 verse 20 chapter 19 verse 20 and the beast was taken and was seen the false prophet which wrought miracles before him was which deceived them that received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image and these bows were cast into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. I pray you will not be there. Chapter 20 I'm reading from verse 10 and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Reading from verse 14 and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death and whosoever was not found reaching the book of life, the Amalekite did not have his name in the book of life. The destroyers of the anointing of the Lord, they do not have their names in the book of life. 
life and those who are scattering the church, destroying the church, defiling the church, secretly with conspiracy, they do not have their names in the book of life and it says so, so ever, so ever was not found reaching in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire and in chapter 21 verse 8, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the upmongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars, Amalekites, all liars, priest seekers, all liars, deceivers, all liars, they will be cast into the lake where born into fire and brimstone. This is the second death. Adamant, chronic, unrepentant, determined priest seekers soon become apostates. The Pharisees sought men's praise at all costs, at the very cost of their own salvation. Many end time miracle workers seek to have men's admiration at the cost of their eternal destiny, and the eternal destiny of millions at the cost of their own soul. Seeking man's praise and losing God's praise is foolishness, it's madness, and it's the major cause of eternal damnation. Why will you seek the praise of men? and lose your own soul why will you seek to destroy a man or destroy a woman or destroy a ministry or destroy a church and then lose your own soul through a long unending eternity why 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 don't you turn around and say lord while the door of mercy is still open and while the voice of the spirit is still calling i turn i turn around i receive jesus as my personal savior lord you forgive son of tassels you can forgive me forgive me and change my life if you repent today the lord will do it and then those of us who are leaders in the church that you don't uh, you know put your head down and then allow a stranger and a Malachite to lay their hands on you and destroy your anointing, destroy your head. I pray it will not happen to you. You are a man, God has anointed you, a woman, God has anointed you, and God brought you to a place like this. You don't want a deceiver, you don't want a flatterer, you don't want the people who are trying to warm their way through to you, you don't want a, a Madikai to come to you, and then they destroy you, you become like a piece of bread, you become shallow, you become nothing. It's like they have taken your strength away, they have taken even your heart away, and you do not have the fire, the grit anymore to say, Thus says the Lord, you are going to be delivered tonight. All those people that come to your life and they say they are going to help you, but they are hurting you. They say they are going to make you more farming and more productive, but instead of making you more productive, they are discouraging you and destroying you. The Lord will destroy the enemies of the Lord's anointed. I pray the anointing of the Lord will come heavily upon your life. And the fire of the Holy Ghost will come heavily in your life in Jesus' name. And then all those destroyed that surround you, God will open your eyes to see them. And the fire of the Spirit will drive them away. And then if they're trying to clip your wings, if they're trying to burden you with whatever burden, God will lift up the burden away from you. And once again, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And they, it says they will walk, they will not be weary. And they will run, they will not fail. They will mount up with wings as eagles. And I'm looking for those eagles here tonight. Eagles here tonight. Why don't you rise up and say, Lord, whatever is tying me down and whatever is trying to destroy me and whatever Amalekite is trying to come against my life and they want to destroy the anointing and they want to destroy the anointed of the Lord and they want to destroy the ministry you have given me and they want to make you like a piece of bread and they want to make you shallow they want to make you empty they want to take all the all the sap within you all the energy within you they want to take that away that today the Lord will drive all those Amalekites away from you are you looking for a crown from them? Are you looking for praise from them? Are you looking for appreciation from them? Come away, come out from among them and let all those Amalekites, let them go away and say, Oh Lord, here I am.
Oh Lord, here I am. I want your power. I want your anointing. I want the authority more. I want the anointing to flow. I want the power to flow. I want the fire, the fire, the fire of the Holy Ghost to keep on burning in my heart, in my soul. And I don't want any Amalekite around me, any prayer singer around me, any psychophant around me. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Lord, I want you. I want you more than ever before. Let those Amalekites get out of your sight. Let all those separate seekers, let them get out of your sight and stand up in the strength of the Lord. Stand up in the power of the Lord and say, Lord, I will serve you. Lord, I will serve you. Amalekites, get out of the sight of the people of God. Let the Lord deal with them. Let the Lord deal with them and be strong and be strong and be strong. Strong in the grace of God. Strong in the power of the Spirit that nothing will hinder, nothing will stop, nothing will destroy the anointed of the Lord that God has made you. Pray and tell the Lord you will stand. Pray and tell the Lord nothing, nothing, nothing will destroy the great ministry God has put in your hands.